it's I want to talk to you here today about you know just kind of a examining this first Kings chapter 19 and not so much about Jezebel we'll talk a little bit about Jezebel but I'm really not focused on that as much as I am getting victory over discouragement and depression. I want to talk to you a little bit about that because the Bible has a lot of answers for us in that. And, and this is called the Elijah complex. And I, I called it that because Elijah had a unique experience. It's not that unique as men of God in the Bible and other believers in the Bible have dealt with this very same thing. But uh, l- let me pray and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into this and I'll kind of explain to you the the background of this. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we do pray you bless us now and help us to understand from your word the truth of these things. And Lord, help us to be encouraged and strengthened by this. And uh, Lord, to learn the lessons that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, Talking about depression and discouragement is sometimes taboo uh, because a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that Christians can become depressed. Christians can be discouraged. Christians can get down. Okay, and preachers can get down. Preachers can get discouraged. Preachers can get depressed. It can happen to you. It can happen to anybody. All right, and and especially Christians, and I want you to understand that, that that's the first thing it's very important for you to understand because a lot of times we think ourselves above those things. Like that could never happen to us or we should never be in that light or that way. Well, I think it's more should be said this way. We should never stay that way. Okay? That's the difference I want you to understand. We should never stay that way. Not that we'll never get that way, but it's wrong for us to stay that way. Uh, because, you know what? This life is full of trials, and it's, it, it's full of a lot of heartache and pain. It's full of a lot of challenges. It's full of a lot of joy, too, as well. But there are things that vex the spirit and vex the soul. And there are spiritual things that do that. There are physical things that do that as well. Not just spiritual, but there are physical reasons for those things happening. And we need to understand that because sometimes we don't get that. Physical can lead into that, it lead into depression as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to concentrate fully on that here. But it's just, there's an aspect of it that God's people need to understand as well uh, to that. But anyway, I want to talk to you about this Elijah complex because Elijah, he ended up getting a complex. I I, I call it that. I mean, he he had a depression, he has a discouragement. There's other prophets of God that have the same thing. So the preachers are the same thing. Discouragement will come. Challenges like that will come in our lives. And if you've never had that before in your life, please don't think that you're above that. And please don't think that you can never get down and never get discouraged like that and never see dark times in your life. I've seen, you listen, I, until you go through some of those things, you never really understand what that's like. I can say that from experience, having been on the other side of being in a dark kind of uh, dark world rising, um, a, being in that, that I, I can say to you honestly that I have more compassion for people that go through that, that are discouraged, that are down, that get downtrodden like that than I did before. And I believe that's one of the reasons why the Lord allowed me to go through that would be so I could have compassion on others because I became a little bit hardened so to speak to that and not i and i guess basically most of it's out of ignorance never experiencing that never understanding what someone can go through and how that can affect them you you don't really sympathize with them you don't have compassion for them you're like you know what i i don't understand why you feel that way or why you act that way or why you're that way right just get over it is what is is your is your initial reaction to that type of thing, especially if you're if, if everything's going good for you and you're walking with the Lord and the sun is shining and everything's good, you're thinking, hey, what's wrong with you, buddy? You need to get right with God. And, yeah, just stop it. But it's not that simple sometimes. It should be. But there's reasons for that. And we need to look at some of that. I want to show you some things. And I want this to be an encouragement to you. I want you to understand that the Bible says that that Elijah was a man of like passions. What did that mean? That's right, Isaiah. But we're not talking about him right now, okay? We're talking about Elijah. Look, buddy, you'll have a time to preach someday, okay? Don't, Don't take mine now, all right? When I'm old, you can do it, okay? Just stop it. Anyway. Could be the sons of thunder right there. I don't know. And the 
<laughs> Fingers Malachi. <laughs> Telling you. Raising an army. Amen. Right? James will be the one with fast legs. We'll call you the prophet with fast legs. Amen. Anyway, I don't want to give out this. <laughs> James is fast, man. <laughs> flash anyway <laughs> but um you know sometimes he, but but it's important that, that we look at this and we understand that he's a man of like passions what does that mean it means that he got discouraged he got down he was a normal man just like you and i he got discouraged he got down he got overwhelmed sometimes it's not a th those things are not a sin it's a sin to stay that way and god doesn't ever keep us that way if you're his child he's going to move you through that you know, he's going to move you through that. Sometimes those seasons are long. And they don't feel like they're going to end. But they will. They will end. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of, of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You know, this is the Elijah complex. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go to the background of this, what Elijah went through, what was happening with him. But, um, you know... Elijah just had a major victory and slew a bunch of prophets. I mean, he had the highest spiritual victory of his life and the, the, the most pivotal point of all of his ministry. And it didn't take long before trouble started coming. And before he started to get depressed and discouraged. You know, Elijah had the perfect storm. I've had those before. Where, man, you just can't. I mean, it's like the perfect storm that moves in. It's like, oh, man. You are just bombarded from every direction. You ain't getting out. It's just you're in it. <laughs> you know, and it, it's a perfect recipe for, for discouragement and depression. You know, um, so the first thing I want you to notice is there was a great warfare and a great victory. Elijah witnessed the greatest victory as a man of God he had ever had. God had in chapter 18 caused no rain to come upon the earth in Israel for three years there. That's a long time. So Ahab, Ahab is searching high and low for him to find him. Uh, verse 17 talks about that. First uh, Kings chapter 18, verse number 17. Let's look at that. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? First thing the old, that, that old wicked king asked him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Right? What did he say to him? What was his, I like his response. That's the response every preacher ought to give to somebody. That's the response I give to people. I've been blamed for everything under the sun. I'll tell you that right now. If you preach God's word, you'll be blamed for every person's problems in their whole life. Man, it's all your fault. Well, that's amazing. I didn't know you didn't have any problems before you met me. Man. Amazing, isn't it? How that works? Isn't that something? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house. Look, th this is really the source of a lot of problems. Most of them, all of them. In that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. There you go. Just stop right there for a second. Why are you troubled? Well, have you forsaken the commandments of the Lord? I'll tell you what, if you're a Christian right now, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're going to have a lot of trouble come your way. Your heart, your mind, your soul is going to be troubled. If you have forsaken the commandments of God, your soul will be troubled. You can't blame the preacher. You can't blame God for that. It's you. You've forsaken the commandment of the Lord. You're going you're gonna to have some trouble. Amen. So that's when you search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Better start to, before you start pointing the finger outward at Elijah, you better point it inward and say, God, you need to search my heart. For the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? i got to start searching my heart and saying, okay, wait. well, no, but you know the first thing? You know, I've seen this so many times. I'm telling you. It's just like fallen man or it's just like a backslidden Christian to blame the preacher. They blame the preacher. And he's preaching for all their troubles. You know as well as I do, a lot of your family members do that. 
They blame the preacher. Don't they? It's that preacher's fault. I saw it yesterday. Somebody online that listens to us, <laughs> their relative got mad. Said, that's because you're following that preacher. Well, I don't even talk to that brother, but maybe once in like six months, four months or something. Like that. Once every, you know, three or four months. I don't even talk to that brother that much. He listens to our sermons. It's not because he's following me. It's because he's following God. But they don't want to blame God because then they really look like a devil. So they'll do the next best thing. They'll blame the preacher for it. They'll blame that authority. I'm telling you, Brother Andrew and I are going to do a, a radio show soon, very, very soon, on this anti-church movement that's out there, this absolute vitriol hate for authority in the church. I mean, it's, it's rabid online. I see it everywhere. It makes me sick how fake it is on Facebook. It's just, it is. It's absolute rebellion to God's order and hate for what God has done. Hate for his church. They want to go their own way and seem religious. They absolutely hate it. So Ahab, he's searching high and low. He's blaming, he's blaming Elijah. He sees him. You know, my answer needs to be the same answer. Any preacher's answer needs to be the same answer as Elijah. I've not troubled thee. But thou and thy father's house has troubled you because you forsook the Lord your God and followed the world, the flesh, or the devil. You want to obey the truth. You know, life is not always easy, but as a Christian, it is always simple. There's a difference in simple and easy. You know, when things get complicated is when you don't want to obey the simple commands of God. You want, to, you want to get some discouragement coming your way? Just stop obeying the commandments of God. Start doing your own thing. Yeah, it don't get easier. It gets complex. Very complex and confusing. And that complexion, that complexity and that confusion leads to depression. It's where it heads. It's right where it goes. All right. You know, Adam did the same thing to God, though, didn't he? He said, the woman thou gavest to be with me. God, it's your fault. You gave me the woman. It's her fault. And it's your fault. It's not mine. Right? Yeah, she was perfect, but it was God's fault. Right? It's the woman's fault. It's God's fault. See, nothing's changed. That's a sign of that fallen creation. Right? To blame God and blame his providence and blame his preachers. For the, that's what they did. They, that's why they stoned all the prophets. That's why they killed them all. I seen somebody at a meme the other day, and it said, it, said, it was funny because it said, uh, you know, oh, no, it was a ba that Babylonian bee. And there was an article that said uh, that people told Jesus that they weren't, that he wasn't being enough like Jesus or something like that. I thought that was funny. Did you see that? I thought that was funny because that's really how people are. They're like, no, everybody's supposed to love you. You mean like they did him? They killed him. Yeah. And, all the prophets. and all the prophets. It said from the blood of righteous Abel. And you thought everybody was going to love you when you decided to preach God's word? Yeah, I did actually. But <laughs> I did. Boy, did I ever get I was. Boy, boy, I'll tell you something. Did I ever get a wake-up call? Whoa. I was I was wait I was waiting for them to strike up the band. I was waiting for a procession. I was waiting for all, and then all of a sudden, whoa! Everybody hates me. They didn't even want my chicken or my subway. He said, "Yuck." <laughs> Amen. But watch that boy. <laughs> oh, he is you. Oh, it's going to be great. And I get to tune in for it all. It's going to be so awesome. <laughs> it's going to be so awesome. Anyway, um, but Adam, he blamed God and Eve and blamed God for blessing him with a wife and all that. There was a great war going on, though, for the heart of the nation of Israel at the time, though. Israel was wholly given over to idolatry, and the prophets of Baal were 450. They and Ahab were taking the nation over. But God had others 
but he used Elijah. And Elijah saw God use him to wrought a great victory. Elijah's seen the power of God. He watched it. Now listen to me. You think, how could a guy ever get depressed or discouraged when he's seen the power of God like that? Well, it can happen. He's a man of like passions. Amen. I mean, he, Elijah, he, he mocked their gods. He called down fire from heaven. He had victory after victory. He saw all of those prophets slain. He slew them himself. Just like Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Elijah did the same thing. Elijah, he did the same thing. He said, look, how long halt you between two opinions? If, if the Lord be God, then serve him. If Baal be God, then serve him. Same thing Joshua said. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But we have to beware because when great victories come, great trials and temptation will follow. Satan doesn't like losing a battle. And that spirit of Antichrist is ever at work and never sleeps and is there to wear out the saints of the Most High. And Elijah was being set up for that Elijah complex. He had, the, he had what I call that Elijah complex is what he had. Now next, number two, it's important to note that Jezebel, that Jezebel spirit hates God. Oh, does it ever hate God? That Jezebel is ever at work to wear down real manhood and real love for God and discourage and depress and suppress any man of God who will stand for that which is right. I see it. Man, you see it so evident. They hate strong, bold preaching, male or female. Either one of them can have that spirit. They hate that strong, bold preaching. They'd give anything if they could just soften that preacher down, wear him down. Understand this, there is no fear of God in Jezebel. She has a perverted spirit, and she has that spirit of Antichrist that is bent on destroying real patriarch. The real patriarchs, they hate that. They hate that. They hate that real manhood that leads. You can say you're a man all you want to, but when you start leading like one, that's why they don't like it. Start talking like one, start acting like one. They get mad quick. Amen. And they're fine with setting up anything that worships anything other than Christ. Real male le leadership and strong spiritual leadership is hated and resented and sought out and chased away and rooted up and discouraged and destroyed if need be. Turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. You're right there. Just turn over. Verse number 1 and 2. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. I mean, Ahab is such a wimp. He runs back to his wife and he tells her, I, look what Elijah did. And he's just like, what are we going to do? <laughs> and then Jezebel sent a message. And Jezebel, she's just like cold as ice, right? <laughs> Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them tomorrow about this time. <laughs> now, you'll notice that Jezebel, she sent, the, she sent the message by, or she sent that by a messenger. Because she couldn't do it straightforward, because Jezebels don't really work that way. They always like to work behind the scenes and make it look like they're staying in their proper role, in their proper place. Yeah, that's the, that's the cover, Right? Then Jezebel brought on that complex that Elijah ended up getting. She knew just the right time in her rage to attack Elijah and to strike fear in his heart. I'm not going to talk about the Jezebel spirit that much, but it is amazing to me how you can slay 450 prophets, the king of Israel and everything else, but man, one Jezebel comes after you, you start running for the hills. Right? Literally. That's a nasty spirit. I'm telling you, it is a nasty spirit. It really is. He was spiritually weak, though. And she pushed that right spirit of paranoia and fear in Elijah. He was just at that point where, and I'll tell you what, after you have strong victories, that's what happens. You start to get weak. I've had it happen after laboring on Sunday and Saturday, preaching and all that, and then Sunday, and then come home Sunday, and then I'm like, I can just feel like I'm Sunday night, and then Monday I just feel weaker. And I just know I'm in a vulnerable place at that point that i got to be careful. Because I'm at a place where I've been wore down and I've got to recharge. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, yeah. Number three, the Elijah complex is fueled by fear. This is not necessarily a uh, specific order, but just characteristics of this. He was afraid. She shook him and brought fear to him. Remember, she was a witch working for Satan. That's what Jehu called her. He said, he said, he said uh, is it peace, Jehu, the king said to him? Is it peace? He said, what peace? There could be no peace with, as long as I mother and her whoredoms, and her witchcrafts and her whoredoms are so many. Right? And when she and when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servants there. So he ran. Elijah ran away from her. And he shouldn't have ran away from her. Right? Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 14 says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. We've, we talked about these verses before. Romans eight fifteen. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Elijah was shaken. He was shaken up. He had to go. He had to get out of there. You know, even saved people and, and mighty men of God can get in their flesh. They can get succumb to fear and paranoia. And there ain't nothing like having a Jezebel after you that to bring fear and paranoia, be it male or female. Elijah, he was very fearful of what was coming to him. He hid himself, or he tried to. He ran. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know what we do most of the time, though? When the devil starts roaring, or he has, or he has some kind of a, a, a tool, like a Jezebel, or like another man, or somebody to come after us, a tool that he uses, or a weapon he uses against us, instead of submitting ourselves to God and resisting the devil, we do not fight the devil. We run from the devil. Devil, and when we run from that, what happens is he comes chasing us because he knows we're afraid. And the devil operates on fear. Do you understand that? Listen to me. Look at me closely. There are some that are more feeble than others. I don't, I, I, I don't resent that. I understand that. Now listen to me, though. You have to understand one thing. The devil is fueled by your fear. The more you fear, the more fuel you give for his fire. You are not obeying the Bible when you fear the devil. Or when you fear that satanic oppression, or when you fear, when you are built up with doubts and fears, because fear is not an operation of the Spirit of God. It is a work of the flesh. It means you are in the flesh. You are not walking in the Spirit. If you were walking in the Spirit, you would not be consumed with doubts and fears. So I have to change my thought process. I have to renew my mind. Why? Because I'm succumbing to fear. And that's going to lead to depression. That's, that's where it goes. I'm afraid of what's going to happen. I'm afraid of this. I become afraid of that. And then I start evil surmising. And then, I start doing that. And then I start getting down. And then I start getting discouraged. And then I start getting downtrodden. You know why? Because you're operating in the flesh. You're, oper you're not operating the spirit. That's not the spirit of God leading you to fear. The spirit of God leads you to fear God, not the devil. Not circumstances. Not trials and tribulations. That's not the spirit of God that leads you to fear that. That's your flesh. You're walking in the flesh. You're going to be devoured. Quickly. Quickly. That's the opposite. Why would you ever run from the devil and his kingdom <laughs> when you've already been promised the victory over it? Why would you do that? Why? Why? You're doing the op opposite of what you're supposed to. It says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. What does that word resist mean? Fight. How do I fight? 
with this, with this. You have a sword. You've been given armor. Fight. No, here's what you do. I'm going to tell you what you do because I've been there and I do it. Here's what you do. You sit next to Scott. No, that's not what you do. <laughs> Brother Scott, sit next to Brother Scott. How you doing, Brother Scott? I'm Elijah, and, and, and I'm sitting under my juniper tree, and I'm just going to die. Sound about right? See, I don't do that. You're a liar. You're a liar. I'm going to call you a liar. If you tell me you don't do that, you're a liar. You know how I know? I can see it on the countenance of your face. That you're sitting under the juniper tree, and you're ready to die. You've given up already. You're letting him win. You're just letting him win. You're sitting there and dying. Just like Jonah did with that stupid gourd. You're going to sit there and you're going to die. How do I know? Because I've done it. That's how I know. I've done it. I get the circular reasoning in my mind and I just let it keep going and going and going and going and going. And I keep entertaining it and entertaining it and entertaining it. And pretty soon it consumes my whole countenance and my whole outlook and everything. And I'm gripped with it. And I'm under the juniper tree and I'm ready to die. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're running. You're not fighting, you're running. That's what happens. You start running. You're running from the devil. That's what you're doing. You're not fighting. You quit fighting, you've already given up. You said, okay, I'm going to die in this juniper tree. The devil's right, I can't win. I've already lost. I'm defeated. I'm discouraged. I'm down. I'm depressed. Life's too hard. Woe is me. I'm going to die under this tree. What is my life worth? I'm going to sit in this tree and I'm going to die. I'm going to give up. You quit fighting. That's what happened. You quit fighting. You stop fighting. You're not resisting the devil. You're agreeing with him. You're agreeing with him. You're saying, you're right. It's too late. I'm done. I can't win. I can't get the victory. I've already given up. So I'm running. I'm going to run to my juniper tree, and I'm going to sit underneath my juniper tree, and I'm just going to die. And that's what the devil wants you to do. You know, Jezebel should have been the one running from Elijah. And oh, she got hers. But Elijah was running from Jezebel. That's the opposite. That's where Satan likes us to be. Totally living beneath our privilege. Totally living beneath what God has enabled us to do. Uh, to as many as are received, unto them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But no, we, we, we act like we're not sons of God. We act like a defeated foe. We've already been whipped. So let's go into the juniper tree. Let's go die. Come on, everybody's done that. Every single one of us have done that before in our lives. We've gotten under that juniper tree. We said, you know what? It's too hard. This challenge is too big. The struggles are too hard. Everything is too rough. I'm going to give in to discouragement. I'm going to give in to depression. I'm going to give myself over to that. And I'm going to give myself over to circular reasoning. And I'm just going to die. So know this, that you're completely in disobedience to God. You're caught up in circular reasoning. And instead of submitting yourself to God, you have submitted yourself to the devil. And you have ran from God. That's what you've done. You've done the opposite. You've actually submitted to your enemy and you've ran from God. And you're wondering, like, why, why am I so beat up? Well, I don't know, because you're doing the opposite of what God told you to do. That's why. You're supposed to submit to God and then resist the devil. And guess what he does? He runs from you. He runs from you. He's supposed to be running away from you. Not you running away from him. You stand your ground. Right? Right? Stand there for. It doesn't say sit under the juniper tree and die. It says get up and fight. Stand. Not sit. Stand. See what happened? We get in the flesh. We get fearful. 
Fear is not an attribute of godliness nor fruit of the Spirit. It's a work of the flesh. Elijah's faith was weak after the victory had become fearful. When we give in to fear and paranoia, we're not trusting Christ, and the devil has us right where he wants us. Perfect place for depression and discouragement. Perfect place, that dark place to get sunken down into. Next, I think it's number four. Elijah believed he was alone. He was the last man standing. Oh, I'm telling you, now this is that Elijah complex right now, right here. And I don't care who you are, a preacher especially, or anybody. Man, sometimes you get it in your mind, you are the only one left. There ain't nobody left standing but me. Well, that's where Satan wants you to think. Why? Because that's pride. That's spiritual pride. So you think, well, I'm the only one doing right. That's it. There's nobody left but me. Right? That's it. Just me. All you other ones are messed up. <laughs> Tell you, you're all messed up, but I'm doing right. You've never thought that in your mind, have you? Oh, yes, you have. Oh, yes, you have. Yes, you have. You've thought that in your mind. You've thought, you know what? I don't know what's wrong with all these other people. But I'm going to keep serving the Lord, and I'm the last one here. Nobody else wants to do right. But I'm righter than they are, Scott. I'm right, Brother Scott. I'm righter than they are. You ever thought that? Sure you have. You maybe never said it because you know how foolish it sounds when you say it. So I'll say it for you. Mm-hmm. I wish these people were as right as me all the time. Man. Right? Especially Jacob. I wish he was as right as me, man. Right? You ever thought that? You ever looked at your brother, brethren and thought that? Oh, you may not have said it, but you thought it. It's where it starts in the mind. It starts in the heart. We develop that pride. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 10 there. You're already there, I think. Verse number 9, we see, um, And he came thither unto a cave and, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. I'm it. God, I'm it. There's nobody else. So he tells the angel of the Lord that, right? Hey, look, I just want you to know I'm, I'm it. I'm the only one left. And nobody but me. Last man standing right here. Super Christian. Got my cape and everything. Right? Sitting under my juniper tree and dying. With my cape on. Right? You'd be, you'd be surprised at how you can be in a spiritually despondent or depressed place, but in your mind, you actually think there's something superior about you. Wait a minute. So you're telling me you're under depression right now, but you're you're a better Christian than somebody than your brother because you developed that in your own mind? Let me help you. That's called pride. That's all that is. And it's part of the problem you're in the place that you're in. Because of pride. You know, many had died. But he wasn't alone. Elijah was believing that he was alone and no one was left to earnestly contend for the faith. Elijah makes the mistake before the victory to say that too, by the way. Turn to uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 22. He hints at it before. This is when you know that he's going to get in some trouble with this. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, in verse number 22, I, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. So see, Elijah, he, he started thinking about it. He's like, you know, it's just me. I don't know. It's just me. That's it. Just me. Nobody else is left. 
Even though, remember, Obadiah protected the prophets of the Lord and fed them in the cave. Remember that? That was just the same. Remember Obadiah even told him that, hey, doesn't, don't you know that, that, that didn't anybody tell you that I protected all these prophets in the cave and fed them and hid them from Ahab and Jezebel? I hid them out in the cave. You remember that? There Elijah merely said that he alone remained to execute the prophet's office, which was true in this, in this sense, but here he implies that he's the only prophet left alive. He started to go to his head a little bit. He was starting to get that complex. I'm alone. It's just me. You know, Elijah wanting to reprove Israel for their idolatry had made an excuse why it was okay for him to run away from Jezebel. He's like, hey, I got to run away from her. I'm the only one living, so I got to get away from Jezebel. No, you should have stayed there and defeated her. But he didn't. He ran from her. He became prideful in thinking he was the only one left and that no other stood for the faith. That all those men that hazarded their lives and hid from Jezebel were not there any longer. He'd forgotten the sacrifices of his brethren. That door's open back there, by the way. You might want to shut that. And the back one, all the way in the back's open. <clears throat> okay. But this also gave way to his discouragement and depression. By the way, that's where Satan wants you to believe that you're alone. Do you know that? Satan wants you to think that you're alone. Yeah, isolation, so he can destroy you. So he wants you to think that you're all alone, nobody else cares, you're the only one standing, you're all by yourself, nobody else cares about you, nobody else cares about your life, nobody else is. That's what Satan wants you. Right? Right? Like to keep you away from the church of God, like to keep you away from the saints of God, like to keep you isolated so he can destroy you. That's what he wants to do. Right, just like the lion in Africa, right, that's what he does. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour, looking for that one that's off by themselves so he can grab them, the vulnerable one. He's looking for that one that's vulnerable, he's looking for that one that's weaker, that's off by themselves. He's looking for that sheep that is sick, that has wandered off by itself. Because that's what sheep do when they're sick. They wander off by themselves. When there's something wrong with the sheep, it, it wanders off. It doesn't stay in the flock. And that's where Satan wants him. He imagined he was the only one. You know, if we don't put our imaginations into check, we'll follow them. We'll get in a lot of trouble. The devil will use our own imaginations along with things he implants, those whispers of the wicked one, right? To make us believe we are all alone and no one else is there to help us or to stand for the faith. Or in the trial that you're in, anything. You get that in your mind. You start to think those things. Then, number five, discouragement and depression comes with that. That's what comes after. When you're isolated, when you feel isolated, Discouragement and depression comes. Look at verse number four. Verse number three. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He left all his servants and everybody. Went, went off by himself. Hey, you want to know a sign of depression? I've seen it. Everybody that does it, they get off by themselves and don't want to be around anybody else. They isolate themselves. They don't talk to anybody. They harbor up all those thoughts in their heart and in their mind. And they start rolling around in them. And they don't stay engaged with people. They get off on their own. Elijah wasn't going off on his own to commune with God. He was going under the juniper tree to die. That's where he was going. He wasn't going to live for God. He wasn't going to pray to God. He was going to die alone. And that's what happens when somebody's discouraged and depressed. You want to know about depression? I'll tell you depression. I've seen it, friend. I, I, I've lived it. I've experienced it. I know what it's like. And I'll tell you something. I've seen people have it. And what they do is their trade is to go off alone and die. That's what they're going to do. Go off alone. They get depressed. They don't want to tell anybody. They don't want to talk to anybody. They don't want to admit anything to anybody. They just go off alone. They bought, I don't, you know what? And they don't talk to people. They don't stay engaged with people. They harbor themselves up by themselves and they keep to their own thoughts. I'm going to tell you why you keep to your own thoughts. You want to know why you do? Because if you told people those thoughts, they'd say, you're nuts in the head. You stop thinking that way. That's not true. 
You've got no basis for what you've imagined in your mind. You've, you've thought it all up in your mind, and the devil's been feeding and fueling it, and it's gotten big like a fire in your mind. And when you rationalize it, when you speak those things, that's why people that commit suicide, that's why they don't talk to anybody. They go off by themselves, and they don't talk to anybody. You know why they don't talk to anybody? Because if you started telling me what you're going through, and you start rehearsing it, and you start speaking it out, you're like, well, that sounds stupid. That don't sound good. That's not even logical. Mm-hmm. The thoughts that you've had in your heart, they're not logical. Well, they're, not, they're definitely not scriptural. And you've developed this whole scenario of everything in your mind, and you've gotten yourself discouraged and depressed, and the devil's been throwing fiery darts at you, and you've been sitting alone. Sitting, in alo sitting alone. You know where you're at? You're under the juniper tree ready to die. That's where you're at right now. Oh, I know it's hitting home today. I'm telling you I know it is. I'm telling you. Because when I wrote this, I was like, well, this isn't even that good of an outline. This doesn't even, this doesn't even like seem like it's going to go anywhere. But I know it is because I know what happens to people. And I know what you start thinking in your mind. Because I've been there before. And you get yourself so down and dark and discouraged. <clears throat> That's where the devil wants you. Dark times. Every man of God will experience this at different times. Every Christian will experience it somewhat. If you haven't yet, hang on, it's coming. You will. The trials of this life make us want to die sometimes. Notice that Elijah did not say he would take his own life. He just said he wanted to die. Right? What did he say? Look what he said here. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. He got really discouraged. He got really depressed. Times got really dark. And you know what he said? He said, it is enough now. Oh, Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. Well, of course you're not. Who said you were? Just because God used you don't mean you're better than your father's. You might be a little better off, but you ain't any better. Right? Think about that for a second. He said, Lord, just take my life. I want to die. I don't want to be here anymore. You know, Jonah wanted to die too. After the whole nation of Nineveh was saved. I mean, that's one of the greatest revivals you've ever seen in your life. And what's that prophet want to say? What's that preacher say? Ah, I want to die. I think I'll go off and look at this Gordon die. The whole nation just got saved. Yeah, but I want to die. Preachers are really funny people, though. People don't understand them. I'm telling you, they don't understand them. You'll, it, it'll be hard for you to ever understand them. I, I'm telling you, it'll be hard for you to understand a preacher. You'll never, on this side, most people, besides preachers, they understand each other fairly well. How they think. It's, it's different. They just see things differently. They react to things differently. It affects them differently. What may affect you and not be a big deal to them pierces their heart through. Trying to explain the... When you raise up sons in the ministry and have them pierce your heart and betray you is one of the hardest... I can't explain it. I can only say that Jesus went through it. And that's how I understand it. And that I've experienced it. And it's, it's very discouraging. Notice that Elijah, he didn't say he was going to take his own life, though. It's not really that strange. You think, isn't that strange? Why would he want to do that? When I, you know, when I, when he's had seen the greatest spiritual victories, let me tell you something. I've, I, I've seen depression and discouragement right around the corner creep into my mind. I mean, it's just like clockwork. Right after the victory. And my heart. And we can get consumed with despair and discouragement. He said, it's enough. I've lived long enough. I can do no more good among this people. Just let me now end my days. 
He requested for himself that he might die, like Moses and, and Jonah. <laughs> the prophet's depression here reached its lowest point. He was still suffering from the reaction of an overstrained feeling. Remember, I mean, that's a lot to go through. When you battle 450 prophets, when you call down fire from heaven, when you see those prophets all destroyed and killed, and Israel turn back to the Lord, and you see all that, and then it's like, whoa, where do I go from here? It's pretty overwhelming. He was also weary from the night travels. He was faint with the sun's heat. You've got to think about the physical aspect of it. There's a lot going on here. And I'm going to tell you what, you've got to think of the physical aspect for you, too. You need to be, that's why you have to take care of yourself physically. You got to get sleep. You got to drink water. You got to eat healthy. You got to, you know, take care of yourself. Because if you don't, and, and you got to exercise, get yourself some exercise. You can eat as healthy as you want, but if you don't exercise, you're still going to get discouraged and depressed and down. You got to get out and get some exercise. Got to do something. Your body's meant to move, it's not meant to sit. It's meant to move. It's designed to move. It's not designed to sit. Right? And if you don't get exercise, you're going to get depressed or you get tension built up. You get stress built up. You got to do something. You got to move. I don't care if it's a walk a day, just walking for once a day or something. You got to get up and get moving. Don't make any excuses. You're not too busy. Do it. It'll help your countenance. It'll help your attitude. It helps move things in your body. You need exercise. Too many people, we live our, our jobs and the work that we have and everything else. I force myself to do it. I force myself to do it. I rode 20 miles on my bike yesterday. That was fun. I enjoyed that. I want to go for 30 now. Adam, I want to do a 50-mile one. I want to know how far that is, and I want to eventually work up to that. I want to get like a 50-mile bike ride. Absolutely want to do it. I want to find out where that trail is, where your house goes all the way. It goes all the way down, doesn't it? Yeah. How far is that stretch? Oh, that's it? <laughs> oh. Don't laugh, Rachel. I want to do it. <laughs> yes, you can have bacon. As long as there's no nitrates. Anyway, <laughs> look, God made animals for a reason to eat, okay? Especially after the fall. They're there to eat. Dave, stop talking. <laughs> Listen to the sermon. You're discouraging me, okay? Stop it. <laughs> anyway, but no, you need to get out. I'm not saying you have to go bike 20 miles, but you need to get out and do something. It's important. I'm telling you, you don't know the change that it makes in your mind and everything. When you get out, I do it and I pray. Man, I prayed for an hour and a half yesterday out on my bike. Just And there was like nobody out anywhere. It was quiet everywhere. I saw like hardly nobody out there. Or, I know, and I was soaked and I felt good. I did. I felt good. Felt great to do that. It's good to sweat. Nothing wrong with sweat and it's good for you. Bunch of American babies. Yeah, yeah, you do when you work. That's right. Brother Finney gets out on the golf course. It's good exercise, right? It was a good day to go out yesterday. You walked 18 holes? See that? 71? No problem, brother. I'll get my tip later from you. He's a good tip for that guy. But you know what? He's out there walking. He's out there doing something. Do something. Get up. Get get moving like that. It's good for you. It, it'll 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 help you with depression, discouragement. It really will, because God meant your bodies to move, not to sit. Anyway, but the prophet's depression it reached its lowest point. He was still suffering from the reaction of overstrained feelings. He was weary with his night's travels. He he was for the first time alone, alone in the awful solitude and silence of the great white desert. He shouldn't have left his servants like that. He wasn't in the frame where he was talking to God. He was communing with himself. He was entertaining the fact. I mean, the last thing you need to be when you're in fear is alone. You don't need to be alone. You need to talk to somebody. Obviously, pray to God, but you need to talk to you. You have human interaction. God made us. And that I don't mean the Internet. I mean people. All right. I mean, talk to people. 
Call them on the phone. Go see them. Talk to them. Such solitude might brace the soul in certain moods, but in others, it must utterly overwhelm and crush. You know, when you are depressed, the last thing you need to be is alone. You don't need to be alone. You need to be out with people, talking to people, communing with people, right people, people that will help you and encourage you. Look, if, you don't, if you're not going to talk to anybody in this room or anything like that, then at least go to a coffee shop and sit there when you're around people and strike up a conversation with somebody. But talk to people when you're like that. You can't not talk to people. You've got to talk to people. You can't be alone like that. Now, there's a time to be alone. I was alone with God for an hour and a half yesterday. Amen. It was a good time. But you know what? If I'm in a despondent and depressed and discouraged mood, the last thing I need. And see, when I went there, God didn't let me be alone. I had five, I had five kids with me. My wife cruising down the road. Strangers walking up to me. Checking out my van. Right? It's an interesting time. But God didn't let me be alone. He's thrust me right. Nope, you're not going to be alone. That's why you come out of that as you're around people. Amen. Thus the prophet at length gave way completely, made his prayer that he might die, and exhausted sank to sleep. The soul's time of despondent depression, there is a shade sometime or other to cross every flowery bed and the gloom to cover every sunny path. There are occasions in the history of most men when life, the most precious and the first to be desired, is a burden. In this state of, of the soul, all power of enjoyment is gone. And all power and courage have taken their departure. The horizon of the soul is obscured with darkness. So that there is neither beauty nor prospect in view anywhere. Man, I'm telling you, it gets so dark sometimes. You look out when it's that dark. And you can't see the sun. You can't see anything. But everything is discouragement and doubt and darkness. Sometimes this state of despondent depression comes upon a soul from a sense of its own sinfulness. Sometimes you start thinking about your sin and you get really down. And you, you get into that and the devil starts to use that. The thought of our own individual insignificancy has a tendency to do the same result. You know, I, I've noticed that a lot of times when folks get older, they start to feel insignificant as if they're not, God doesn't want to use them anymore, or other people don't need them anymore, you know, they're just in the way and stuff like that. They start feeling that way, you know, and on the contrary, they're more useful then than they've ever been because they have a lot of wisdom and they're needed more at that time than what they realize. Absolutely. Absolutely. More important. More necessary. Amen. The conscious vanity of the surroundings of our present existence is another depressing element in life. Sometimes just the vanity of life, you just see it for what it is. And it's just like, ugh. It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. It's all superficial nonsense. Everything just seems so superficial and, and nonsensical. It doesn't it, It's like... Yeah, vexing, and it vexes you. It's just vexing. I mean, Solomon, he just kept saying it over and over again. This is vanity, a vexation of spirit. Here's a guy that literally gluttoned himself with everything in this life that you could possibly have. And then he was blessed beyond measure with everything, and then some. And you know what he said? It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. That was before Solomon came in. He was coming into his repentance, the end of his life. He's starting to see this life for what it really was and what he had used it for. And he was like, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. And he gave at the end of it what, what man should do. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why? Because he had learned that no matter what God has blessed him, no matter what, everything was vanity. And the, the truth of the matter was that man should fear God and keep his commandments. Right? The darkness and uncertainty surrounding human life has a tendency to make us despondent. Sometimes, you know, we don't know what the future holds, the darkness, the challenges that come, the trials and tribulations, everything like that. And we start to look at that. Now, listen to me, friend. I want you to understand one thing about this, because this is one of the problems. Wow, this sermon turned into a longer one than I thought it was going to be. Um, it always does. <laughs> but here's the thing we have to look at, okay? 
What is, why do you think the Bible says sufficient to the day is the evil thereof? Would you stop trying to fix tomorrow's problems? You can't. Deal with today. Don't deal with tomorrow. Why? Because you can't change it. You can't do anything about it. Deal with it today. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. You got enough. You can't change one hair on your head. Look, it's all going gray. It is better than losing it, I guess. It's going to be white. Then I'm going to grow my beard down to here and just be like an old prophet with a staff. It's going to be awesome. Everybody's going to hate me. It's going to be cool. <laughs> no, I'll look like Bill Schneblin. I'm not doing that. <laughs> That'll just be too weird. I'm not doing that. Sorry, Bill already stole that look. I can't do that. <laughs> I'm not wearing those big robes, though. <laughs> do you know what? We're, deal with today's problems. Don't deal with tomorrow's. Tomorrow will come. Right? You have the energy to deal with today's. God gives you the strength to deal with today's, not tomorrow's. Right? His grace is sufficient for thee. Okay. The simplest things are lost in mystery. The clearest things are covered with uncertainty. Failing in realizing our noblest plans and most cherished wishes is another depressing element, which often presses us below the level of right sin. You know what? You'll start getting discouraged and depressed when you've set goals and you've not hit them. And God hasn't allowed things to happen. You set a goal or something, expectations, that's right. And your expectations weren't met. Well, you know what? Maybe God said no. Maybe God said no. Maybe God said not yet. Hey, amen? So what am I going to do? I either... Learn that whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, or I complain about it, or I get depressed about it, or I just realize the blessings of God today, rejoice in them, thank God for them, and move forward. The ills that men are subject to is another frequent means of human depression. You know, sometimes all the challenges, you know, the, the health issues and everything else, it can become vexing. Because we, we're in this tabernacle and it's faulty. Amen? It fails us. And it will fail us eventually. Amen? One man said it this way, We may remember the strong contrast of our text in days when we are disappointed by the results of our evangelical work. Elijah was smitten with despair about God's cause. The scornful, scorching words of the wicked and wrathful queen unmanned him. All his grand hopes for his nation and race were to expire at the juniper tree. And very often do the strongest and best of men entertain similar misgivings. Yet Elijah was wrong. God works strangely. He works silently. He works slowly. But he works surely. The funeral was not to be that of Elijah's. You know, Elijah, he was believing the devil. He started to believe what the devil was saying. He believed what Jezebel said. Oh, you're going to be dead. And said, instead of looking at her and saying, oh, yeah, you wicked whore, bring it on. Right? That's what he should have said to her. Amen. Bring it on, you wicked whore. I'm right here. I ain't going anywhere. That's too bold. Well, that's what God called her. Go read it. That's the same thing he called her. That's what he said to her. Actually, God says a lot worse about her. <laughs> so the dogs would lick her blood. Now, there's a sermon I want to preach. Dogs lick her blood. Luke's going to do something with blood dripping out of a dog's mouth and Jezebel's head down there. It's going to be awesome, Luke. <laughs> if your dad will let you. <laughs> well, it's pretty graphic, wouldn't you say? The Bible's pretty graphic about it, isn't it? I mean, more graphic than you and I can be about it. But that's true. I want to say that again to you. God works strangely. He works silently. He works slowly. But he works surely. You know, I'm, I'm starting to see some things yesterday. And I, I've been, I, I told Brother Andrew this week, I was like, I'm not going to mention it now in this sermon, but I'm going to tell you, I was like, Brother Andrew, I, I think, I think something's coming. I think I think God's going to deal with some things. Not in here. 
The Lord's blessed us. Man, we're blessed. God's going to deal with some things. And I saw some things last night. I listened to some things last night where it's coming to pass. And I, and I, I hate to say I knew it was coming, but I did. I could see the pattern. So, you know, he does work strangely. He works silently. He works slowly. But he works surely. He's still moving. He's still working even if you can't see it, especially when you can't see it. That's right. John Trapp said this, and he requested for himself that he might die. He who's, who's so much feared to die by the hand of a woman, lest she and her chimney chaplains should triumph over him and the cause he defended. Begeth now to die by the hand of God as having no longer joy of this mortal and miserable life. This showed that Elijah, Elijah was a man, Elisha was a man subject to like passions. Man, don't you think that's, don't you find that interesting? Hey, what if I could show you a pattern of men of God and good God-fearing Christians that got discouraged and depressed? I'll give you a list of one. Okay, number one, Elijah. A man of like passions. Nobody had the power of God more in that time than Elijah. Jonah. Jonah saw a whole nation converted and got mad after God did it. I knew you were going to do that, God. Why'd you send me here anyway? I just want to die here. He cared more for the gourd than he did the people. How about John the Baptist? John the Baptist was in prison. He got so discouraged, he didn't know if it was Jesus or not. There's one for you. Go study that one out. Art thou he, or look we for another? Wait a minute, you just baptized him, John? Like, you just, you just baptized him. Wait, he's your cousin. You baptized him. You knew who he was. Yeah, but what happened to John? He was in prison. He was getting ready to be beheaded. He knew he was going to die. And his faith was shaken. And he became discouraged. And he just wanted to send out, just to get, just make sure. But Jesus didn't rebuke him, did he? No, he said, go tell John. Jesus didn't come down hard on John. Tell that apostate he can die in there. Asking me if I'm Jesus or not. He knows who I am. Off with his head. Well, that happened, but that's not, that's, that's not the way it was. It wasn't because of him, right? But what did Jesus say? No, he's very kind and compassionate. Go tell John that the gospel is preached to the poor. The dead are raised to life. The sick are healed. He can die in peace. All is well. Amen. Very touching. You know, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't chasten him, did he? Turn to James 5, 17. The Bible talks about this. I, I hope this is helping you today. If not, file it away. It's good medicine. You'll use it again. We'll all be reminded of it. One way or another. James 5.17 says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. What's he mean by that? Man, he got down. He got discouraged. He got depressed. Well, no preacher could ever get that. Man, Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers in the last 200 years. And man, that man fought depression like you wouldn't believe. He fought it hard. One of the best chapters in his book, I still say in that um, lectures to my students, is the, is the minister's uh, fainting fits. Everybody should read that and you'd have more compassion on your preacher. You'd actually pray for me more than what you do. And I'm not saying it to exalt myself. I'm saying that because I need prayer. <laughs> so, but you would have more, more patience and you would have more prayer. If you just read it, I guarantee you read it. How about Job? Job wanted to die. The Bible says Job was a godly man that feared God and eschewed evil. And Job wanted to die. Job went through more than anybody in the Bible besides Jesus Christ. Job went through it. Job saw everything. He lost everything. And what did, what did God say to him? He told him to gird up his loins and stand like a man. And I'll require it of you. Because he got so down and depressed that he started charging God a little bit. <laughs> he started saying, he started exalting himself. He had a little bit of pride there. But the guy had been through a lot. 
right? How about Peter? Peter did the same thing. Spurgeon did the same thing. Other men of God have done the same thing. And how many such are there at this day that sit under Elias, Elijah's juniper tree, willing and wishing to lay down that heavy burden imposed upon them by the Almighty? They just want to die. Don't get stuck under that juniper tree, right? Oh, Lord, take away my life, lest Jezebel take it from me. Little thought, Elijah, now that he should one day be boldly translated into heaven. God of his goodness so provided for his servant that neither Jezebel nor death, which devoureth all men, should have power over him. You think about that. Here he was supposed to die, and she threatened him to die. And man, he was taken up in a fiery chariot to heaven. He never even saw death. That's how much God mocked that wicked Jezebel. She's the one that died. He was trained. He never saw death. That's why I believe he's the one coming back. And Moses. Because there was a fight for his body. For a reason. And I think that and both their miracles are very similar. So anyway, that'll be interesting. But I'm sure somebody else will want to argue about that, but I don't have time. Elijah, Elijah's despondency was partly physical. I want you to listen to this. It was his bodily weariness and discomfort that reacted upon his soul. The practical lesson from this is that a believer ought for his soul's comfort and profit to obey God's material laws, that for our soul's sake it becomes us to care for our bodies. We are to glorify God with our bodies and our spirits, which are his. So we've got to be careful. You've got to take care of yourself. Amen. you got to take care of yourself. Get rest. Drink a lot of water. Amen. Drink a lot of water. Don't drink tap water. That's gross. Sorry, Lee. No, it's not good. It's got to have, it's got to have like uh, strychnine in it or something. I don't know. But anyway, I'm just kidding. I don't know what's in it. I don't want to know. Arsenic, crack, pharmaceuticals. I don't know. Whatever. It is Northfield. <laughs> Oh, well water. I like well water. Yeah. A second cause of Elijah's despondency, doubtless, was that of his occupation was gone. The same cause tends to much of his religious despondency that exists among ourselves. It is wonderful how hard work will cheer and brighten all our thoughts and views. That's true, by the way. That's another thing. Hard work, he says. You know, when you keep somebody busy, they don't have time to be depressed. When you stay busy and focus on what you need to do and a task to get it done, you can't sit around and be despondent. You don't have time to think about that. You also don't have time to get in trouble and dream up garbage to do to people. Jezebel. Right? Because you're busy. You got stuff to do. You got work to do. You got something to keep you busy. You can't stay discouraged when you're busy. You got to get this stuff done. Right? Nothing like hard work to work out that. What You know, when my children start acting and, and foolishness that is bound to them comes out, I know that a lot of good hard work will keep them busy so they don't have time. Right? They don't have time to do that stuff. They don't have time for mischief. Right? Get to work. No time for mischief. Right? A third cause which conduced, which conduced to Elijah's despondency and which does to the despondency of Christians still is the sense of failure. The feeling that having done our very best, we have failed in our work after all. That part gets to us sometimes. We, look at the, we try to look at the results too soon. Just remember, God's the one that keeps track. And just like they asked uh, somebody, I think it was D.L. Moody or one man like that, um, if he was ready to receive his reward. It was either R.A. Torrey or D.L. Moody. And he, said, and he was ready to die. He was on his deathbed. And they said, are you ready to receive your reward? And he said, he said, not till all the accounts are in. See, you don't know the, 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 the results of your work. You'll know it at the judgment seat. You won't know it now. You and I will be surprised what the Lord has done with that. Amen. So we can't, we, God's keeping score of that. He's the, he's the judge, not you and I.
A fourth cause of despondency peculiar to the Christian is the sense of backsliding, the feeling that he is going further from God and that the graces of the Spirit are languishing and dying. The real reason of the disquiet and depression of many hearts is that they are not right with God. You know what? You want to get yourself discouraged and depressed and down and everything else because there's something wrong with your heart. You might not be right with God. That's not all the time, but many times. You might, not, you might be battling. You're fighting God. And if you're fighting God, you're going to get depressed. You're going to get discouraged. If you're resisting God's will, if you're resisting God's order, if you're resisting God's direction, if you're not submitting yourself, if you are exhibiting pride and you are fighting it, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to get discouraged and you're going to get down. Because God's not going to let you be happy in rebellion. God's not going to give you the joy of the Lord while you're rebelling against him. You can think all you want to, you're going to have it, but you're not going to have it. God knows your heart. Remember, we see your outward actions. You see my outward actions, but God sees the heart. And if you're rebelling in your heart, God sees that, and he knows what you're doing. He knows that all you're doing is outwardly conforming, but inwardly you're fighting and resisting the Holy Ghost. So then you're going to be down and discouraged. You're like, why am I down and discouraged? Could be because you're not right with God, and you're disobeying his commands. And you're walking according to the course of this world. And you're not doing what God wants you to do. And that'll bring discouragement. That'll bring depression. That'll bring you down. And God allows it. Listen, like I said before, I don't, I don't know if it's a sin to be discouraged. I believe it's a sin to stay discouraged. <laughs> I think there's a difference. That's number five or six, whatever number that is. Elijah was spoken to for the first time by an angel who fed him and gave him drink for the journey. He could see that he was in a bad way, and God is so merciful that he came to him and fed him and took care of him in his despondency. Listen, God was still his God even though he was under the juniper tree. You understand that? Even though he was ready to die and he was under the juniper tree, God was still his God. So God said, hey, what doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here? You know, when you're discouraged and you're down, God says the same thing to you. And you know it. What doest thou here? What are you doing here? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. Why are you here? Why are you discouraged? It's a good question. God always asks a question to provoke a response from us. He already knows what the reason is. But he says to him, what doest thou here? What are you doing here? Why are you here? Why are you in this place? Why are you at this point? What's wrong with you? Why are you here? Making him think, right? Amen. He's making him think. Let's see. Uh, Jonah. Turn to Jonah. Do we have to see in the books of the Bible or do you know where Jonah is? Some of you don't know that song. But do you know that song, Brother Scott? Look, that's not good enough. What's that? Am I going to sing it? Thank you, Dave. All right. Jonah was in the same place, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled there before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. We've heard those words before, haven't we? Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Don't you love those questions when God asks those questions? Doest thou well to be angry? What doest thou here? Right? What did he say? <laughs> Jonah. So Jonah went out of the city. Doest thou well? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. He said, I'm just going to sit here and die. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah, 
that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad to the gourd. Like, I like my gourd. God, God gave him a happy gourd for his happy place, right? For a safe place. But, the Bible says, but God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. Took away your happy place. <laughs> and it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Why don't you just kill me, God? I do well to be angry. I'm right. Well, that ain't stubborn. Right? He didn't want to come out of that depression. He didn't want to come out of that discouragement. He's being stubborn. Oh, really? You're right to be angry? You're right to feel this way? I'm right to stay depressed, God. I'm right to stay in this. It's everybody else that's wrong. Right? Hmm. No, I don't think so. How about Job? He asked Job a series of questions when he was being tried. All designed when these men were in depression. David asked another question. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Elijah had become so depressed. And God asked him again in verse number 13. What doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here? When you're discouraged and depressed, God asks you the same question. Verse number 14, he gives the same answer again. He just gives the same answer. His depression came because he was stuck on I, 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 I. That's why he got depressed. You want to be depressed? Just keep thinking about yourself. Don't oppress anybody. Right? Start thinking about yourself. Amen. I mean, I get depressed when I think about you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a joke. I mean, thinking about me. <laughs> if you want to, <laughs> I <don't> think so. <laughs> if you want to stay discouraged, stay on I and not on him. God's cure for Elijah's depression. I'm going to show you that, and then we're done. How about that? All right, let me get to it here. Go back to chapter 19. All right, here we go. You ready? Here's, here's, here's God's cure for his depression, for his complex, or his depression, whatever you want to call it. Look at verse number 15. And the Lord said unto him, go. That's first. Go. Get busy doing something. Quit sitting around thinking about yourself. Inactivity will bring discouragement. Get doing something. Get busy. Go. Right? You got to get busy. If you sit around and do nothing and have immobility, it'll bring discouragement and depression. If your mind and heart are not engaged as well as your physical body in something, you'll become depressed or discouraged. God said, go, get busy doing the work I've called you to do. If you're a mom, get busy momming, right? If you're a dad, get busy dadding, right? Yeah. Amen? If you're a husband, get busy husbanding. <laughs> if you're a wife, you better be wifing. <laughs> and I don't be even wife fine either. <laughs> right? If you're single, your service is to the Lord. You can single them if you want, yeah. Get single them. <laughs> right? Amen? Get busy for the Lord. You're to, you're to wait upon the Lord without distraction. That's what you're supposed to be busy doing. And you don't have time to be discouraged. God said, go and anoint this man king in Syria. And he's going to take care of Ahab. And then next, Jehu will be king in Israel. And Jahab and and, and uh, Jehu is going to take care of Ahab there. And Elijah shall be prophet. And look what he said to him. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. 
And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abimelech, that shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. He said, listen, go. Anoint these men and keep going. I'm going to deal with Jezebel. I'll take care of her just like I took care of the prophets back there. Just like I brought down fire from heaven back there. Just like I fed you with ravens by the side. Just like I fed you and I clothed you and I took care of you and I watched over you. Just like that. I'm going to do the same thing again because I did it, Elijah. You didn't do it. I just used you. But I did it. Just like I always do. God got his mind off of him. He said, and God said, furthermore, look at he says in verse number 18. Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. What's he saying? Elijah, I have 7,000 prophets. They didn't bow the knee to Baal. You're not alone. I'm still working. God said, I did all this. Well, you were sitting under the juniper tree ready to die. Amen. You know, look what else cured his depression. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he, and he with the 12, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. You know what? You invest in the next generation. You get busy investing in the next generation. Amen. You don't sit around under juniper tree and die. Amen? It's like you older men, you have a responsibility to invest in the, in the, in the next generation. You have, you have a responsibility to, to give them wisdom, to teach them, to encourage them. Right? To be a strong Christian in front of them. To pray for them. Right? Right? And add your wisdom to their energy. Amen? That's responsibility. Not to sit under the juniper tree and die. Amen. And, you know, God said, get to work serving and training. Don't worry about Jezebel. Jezebels are going to jez. That's what they do. Just let them be jezes. Just let them jazz and let them go on and do their Jezebel thing. They're going to do that. I'll take care of them. Don't worry about them. You know what? That's, that's a lesson for us. Sinners are going to sin and haters are going to hate. Get to work. Don't worry about all those people. You know, you know, there's such a relief with that when you get this, you know, I don't care. I'm moving on for the Lord. There's such a clearness to that. And there's growth in that. And there's fruit that comes from that. When you say, you know what? I don't care. I don't have time to worry about those people. If I worried about every time somebody disagreed with me or did a video about me or didn't like me or thought that I was this secret plant from the land of Kolob that's come to destroy Christianity in America or the world or whatever, something stupid like that, or, I mean, if I worried about that all day long, I wouldn't do anything for God. So I just had to leave those silly women laden with sins alone, the male ones too. You think I'm joking, but I'm serious. <laughs> if we stop every time a Jezebel or a negative person or a sinner opposes us, we'll never serve the Lord. Keep moving. God told Elijah to get busy. He shows him the victory in verse number 17. He says, this is where it comes from. God reminds him, I'm the one that gives victory. If you want to get the victory over depression, then remember where the victory comes from. It's not from your stand, but from your God. He instructs Elijah what to do, and he does it. Obe listen, listen. Obedience brings joy. It does. And reward. In verse 18, he shows us that he has more than just Elijah. There he has 7,000. He gets Elijah's mind off himself and on others. When you help others like Elijah helped Elisha, a victory comes, and so does joy. Elijah followed his flesh and was getting into trouble. When he followed his spirit, he had victory. Nothing like youth to bring you out of discouragement and depression to keep you busy. You know, when you go to a nursing home, those people at a nursing home, what are they like? If you set a little child on their lap or a little child comes in, they sing or a little child plays, they get very, they like that. 
my aunt Betty, when she comes here and she comes to church and she sees when when those little kids come up to her and they they they, they sit on or mercy sits on her lap, that brings a lot of joy to them right away. Why? It's youth that brings them joy, right? Keeping busy and following the voice of the Lord, not the earthquake or the whirlwind. You'll notice something. I want you to notice something. What happened to Elijah? Look at this. Man, I had another lesson for you. I'm sorry. There's one right here. I can't help it. I've got to give it to you here. Um, I want you to notice something here in verse number 9. Or verse number 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Now, what's the lesson there? Notice, he wasn't in the wind. Right? Where was Elijah's eyes at? On the wind. On the storm. Right? Then the earth was shaking. Listen! The earth was shaking. And he was looking for God there, right? He's not looking for God. What's he looking at? He's looking at the earthquake. His eyes are on the circumstance. And then comes the fire, the fire of the trial that's to try you. And where's your eyes at? On the fire. He says, but I'm not in the fire. But then a still, small voice, right? A still, small voice. Where was he? He was in the voice. He was the voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the, of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? It was God's voice. You know, you follow God's voice. Follow the word of God. Elijah didn't die like Jezebel wanted. He was taken up and did not taste death. But Jezebel and Ahab tasted death and the dogs lift up their blood. God used Elijah to anoint Jehu, who drove furiously and slew Jezebel. In the end, Elijah got the victory over that Jezebel spirit and over his own discouragement and depression. And what this lesson shows us is that even godly people can get discouraged or depressed. But we can't stay discouraged or depressed. We have no right to. We have to stay busy for the Lord. Amen. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the truth. I pray that it will help somebody. Lord, I pray that these instructions would... Not go unheeded, Lord, but we would take heed and know that one day we may be in this place of despondency, discouragement, depression. And when we are, that we can look at this lesson and grow from it and say, you know what? The Lord delivers. And keep our eyes and our ears on that still, small voice of the Lord's. Help us now, Lord, we pray. Lord, bless the fellowship and the food to our bodies and the time we have together. Thank you so much for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.